Hello and welcome to episode 30 of the Witcher chapter by chapter book review where I'll go through a summary of what happened in the latest chapter and then I will give my detailed thoughts on it. Today I'm discussing chapter 2 from Baptism of Fire. Alright, well, this should be a good episode, a good discussion, because I do like this chapter. And you know what, I sometimes read online in like forums or um, Witcher, there's like three maybe four at least that i'm familiar with uh different subreddits that have to do with the witcher i I think one of the ones i'm thinking of is just about the witcher 3 so nothing that's really that relevant to this show is going to be in there but uh yeah so so i'll I'll look look at things online sometimes so that i can just see what other people are saying about things and it, it seems like baptism of fire isn't really that well liked not like i don't think that people dislike it i think that out of all of the books, they don't like it. It's it's not going to be in their top favorites. And I mean, I really couldn't say what which of the books would be in my top favorites. Although I, I do know that Blood of Elves would not be <laughs> in there. I know that much. Uh, Time of Contempt would be up there. I love that book. But Baptism of Fire, so far, it's really good. I'm enjoying it a lot. Uh, I like the first chapter a lot. I've already read this the third chapter. Um yeah, I go, I jump ahead a little bit sometimes, but yeah, I thought that that was a good one. I think it's a lot of the characters because there are a handful of characters that we meet that we come to lo- like. Ugh, getting too close to spoilers here. Okay, maybe I should just go into the recap of last episode so that I don't spoil it for anybody, in case you haven't read it, but. Basically, what I'm saying is that I think it's a pretty good book, at least so far. I don't remember everything that takes place in this book. I kind of get everything mixed up. Um, everything that takes place in like Tower of Swallows and Lady of the Lake, and then probably like the back end of Baptism of Fire. But yeah, I think it's a good book, but I don't know. Maybe I won't be saying that by the time we get to the final chapter, which is still a few weeks off. So uh not gonna even bother talking anymore about that (laughs) anyway okay so uh, as always i'll give you the recap on the last episode so that you're caught up and then i will provide you with a summary of this chapter so for the recap milva recalled her first meetings with Geralt, where she reluctantly retrieved tidings from the outside world and news of Ciri's location to deliver to the witcher she discovered from some Squayatel who she helped that the war is extending to Brugge, the direction Geralt is heading in, on his mission to rescue Ciri from Nilfgaard. So she sets out to find him and stop him. Meanwhile, Philippa Eilhart arranged a meeting with seven other sorceresses to propose a lodge that, if established, will look out for the future of magic. Okay, here is the summary of chapter two. At the beginning of their mission to rescue Ciri from Nilfgaard, Dandelion and Geralt find themselves caught up in what becomes a violent exchange between hawkers and Nilfgaardians, exchanging Cahir as a prisoner. Before the Nilfgaardians can kill Geralt, Milva shows up and starts shooting them down. Geralt then frees Cahir from his ties, but warns him that if he sees him again, he'll kill him. Milva joins Geralt and Dandelion on their journey to guide them through a safer trail and avoid getting caught in the war. Along the way, they see battles and many gruesome sights caused by raids and slaughter from the Nilfgaardian invaders. Cahir eventually catches up with the trio and requests to join them because he wants to, or rather has, to help them find Ciri, but Geralt sends him off, reluctantly sparing him yet again. A little while later, they come across a band of dwarves, and one gnome, escorting a group of women and children to a safer location. After a friendly meeting, they join the group that's led by a dwarf called Zoltan Chive. On the road, they get to know each other, play games, and even come across a small venomous monster that the Witcher does not kill, but scares off. They later reach a farm where a young woman warns them to flee from because her family has all died there recently of smallpox. Before they get too far away, they see a gang of marauders approach the farm, attack and force themselves on the young woman. Geralt, who's been feeling helpless since his trip to rescue Ciri keeps getting more and more delayed and difficult, becomes fed up with the sense of helplessness and fights the men with the assistance of Milva and her bow. One of the men manages to get away and rides into the forest, but they then hear his screams as Cahir finishes him off. Turns out the Nilfgaardian knight is still following them and might be a friend after all. 
Okay, here. He is interesting. Don't really know what to make of him because, well, Geralt doesn't give you the chance. <laughs> Okay, so let's talk about some of the Kahir stuff in more detail. Because uh, I, I, I know in the summary I don't provide too much detail because I want to talk about it and I don't want to be repetitive. So, yeah, let's do that now. Geralt and Dandelion stumble upon these hawkers, as I mentioned, who mistake Geralt and Dandelion for Squiatel. I believe they have their hoods up on these cloaks that they're wearing. It's just, it's pouring rain so much of this chapter. Like, they're just getting completely drenched in, or probably soaked in rain because they, I mean, they don't have any shelter or anything. So Geralt, Dandelion, and then eventually Milva, yeah, they're just getting rained on the whole time. Sounds like a pretty crappy situation. And so these hawkers think that they're Squiatel. And then the party of Nilfgaardians show up before Geralt and Dandelion get the chance to leave. So the hawkers are giving the Nilfgaardians, Kahir, who was tied up in a coffin. Don't know why exactly he was in a coffin. Uh, it was arranged by somebody else. I don't know why that decision was made, but that's what it was. So the leader of the Nilfgaardians kills the hawkers and tries to kill Geralt and Dandelion because he thinks that they're all together because the, the head hawker guy tells them that, <laughs> that that's what it is. Uh, uh, Geralt's able to hold them off for a bit, but the leg that Vilgefort's injured gives out, and he's actually about to get killed, and luckily Milva shows up in that moment and starts shooting them down. Then Geralt did take out a couple of them first, but he was about to get killed because that leg is not doing good, which is very unfortunate. So, recognizing Kahir as the man who tried to capture Ciri on Thaned, and also knowing him from her nightmares uh, when he was escorting her out of Sintra. Uh, Geralt really wants to kill this guy, but he doesn't, as Kahir is just completely defenseless. So, when it comes to the Hawkers and the Elf Guardians, what they do when they first meet... I'm sorry, I feel like I just went a little bit out of order here. <laughs> I think I just didn't have it organized in my notes properly. I apologize for that, but it's going to happen sometimes. This is the 30th episode, so cut me some slack, please. <laughs> so anyway... The Hawkers and the Nelf Guardian exchange these passports. So the Hawker says, uh, fo- Foil Tiarna. Not sure if I'm saying that right. And then the Nelf Guardians say Rideau. So Viscount de Rideau is the head of Nelf Guard's military intelligence. We have met him before very briefly, but we have met him. So in the previous chapter, Milva mentioned to Geralt that Foil Tiarna is a, he's a wanted elf for leading the Squiatel commando that was on Thaned, the day of the Thaned coup. So the hawker says Foil Tiarna, and then he says, I've been with Foil Tiarna. So it looks like the squirrels had Kahir, and they were handing him over to Nilfgaard. So if Kahir was delivered, he was definitely going to be executed. He might have even been executed in some barbaric way. Uh, We've gotten a little bit of a glimpse into how Amir likes to punish the people that does him wrong, and I well, we know that he's already not happy with Kahir. He had, this is his one chance to redeem himself was to capture Siri, and he messed that up really bad. So luckily for him, he did not get handed over to the Nilf Guardians. It all worked out in his favor. Um, but yeah, that's what the plan was. They were going to hand him over. I don't really know what the details, like the any of the, anything that led up to that. What I'm guessing happened is the elves were delivering him from Thaned. Like they, they were actually, there were some Squiatel near him on Thaned when Ciri like sliced him up and almost killed him. So I'm guessing that they captured him knowing that they could possibly get a reward from Emir if they were to hand Kahir over. So they must've known some of the details, which is pretty interesting when you think about it. So anyway, after uh, Geralt, Dandelion and Milva have been traveling for a few days, Kahir catches up with them and Geralt is, quite furious and he actually tries to challenge him to a fight but Kahir refuses he will not fight Geralt and he says that he wants to join them on their search for Ciri he says he must and he has to he also says he's not a Nilf guardian that he <laughs> comes from Vigavaro which is a place I don't think has ever been mentioned before it's just odd that <laughs> he was a Nilf guardian soldier and he was working for Amir and his father is also a seneschal for Amir so um Kind of weird that he's not a Nilf Guardian, but yeah, I guess we can't really refer to him that way anymore since it's been established. He's from Vicovaro, he's not from Nilfgaard. <laughs> so Milva threatens to shoot his horse so he can't catch up with them again, and then he quickly rides off. 
So nobody understands why he'd want to join them. But since he killed the bad guy that got away at the end of the chapter, he seems like he might actually be okay. So I, I don't know exactly what Geralt's feelings are uh, after Kahir kills that guy. I know he is wondering what's going on. I really wish he would just go ask him, though. Like, that was a little bit frustrating. I'm thinking, okay, Geralt, he's willing to talk to you. Just go talk to him. Hear him out. Because I want to know what he wants. <laughs> but no, he, he just wants to kill him. And I get it. I understand why I want to kill him. But Kahir's not giving up. He's just... He keeps on following them. I don't know exactly how many days they were into their trip when they ran across that little farm with the poor girl um, that was attacked and then Kahir killed the one guy that got away. But it was, I mean, at least multiple days that they were traveling and Kahir's just behind them by himself, keeping a safe distance, like close enough so that he can keep track of them, but far away enough that they don't see him at all times. I mean, Zoltan actually um, noticed him. He said that he noticed the horse and that somebody was following them, but it didn't bother them. So he wasn't going to stick his nose in that business. But um, yeah, it's pretty strange. There's definitely something going on there. I don't know. Aside from Kahir trying to escort Siri out of Sintra, Back during the first Nulf Guardian War, I don't know what other connection he would have with her. And also being ordered to capture her. And if she's supposed to be in Nilfgaard, we know she's not. But if she's supposed to be, and what his job was, was to deliver her there. Obviously, he's not trying to redeem himself again with a mirror. Yeah, it's very strange. But hopefully we'll get some answers on that soon. But let's move on and talk about the war. So we see a little bit of what's going on there. We don't really get uh, any more insight from a like a broad perspective, from like a political perspective, I guess. But we do get some updates, at least, from what it looks like if you are mixed up in it, if you're a peasant, even a little bit as a soldier. It's not good. So while traveling, the trio see many scenes of war. First, they see a battle for a village in Brugge where Nilfgaard is receiving aid from Veridin, since Veridin, as we now know, uh, recently became part of Nilfgaard, and also Squiatel. So they burned down the village and murdered all the villagers trying to escape. And it was actually really, really sad, um, not just because of those obvious things that I just stated, but also uh, Milva mentions that they rebuilt that village after the last Nilfgaardian war. It burnt down, or they had it burned down the last time and they rebuilt it and now it's just burned down again it's awful it's so awful and that's not the last of the awful things so uh the three of them pass by many villages and settlements engulfed in flames or scorched from previously being burnt down they see many corpses Uh, they see peasants with no home nowhere to go probably don't have any food i'm sure they'll be exposed to some kind of illness if they don't die of starvation or dehydration. It's really awful. And they also, um, they see these devastated battlefields and they actually start going through there and looking for food. And at one point, they stumble upon a cart that says Vera, I don't know how you say her last name. I'm just gonna go with, I'll I'll just give it my best shot. Lowenhopt? That could be right. Uh, But Vera Lowenhopt and Sons. And Vera was actually dead under the cart. But Vera was actually one of the audience members during Dandelion's performance under Bleoberus in chapter one of Blood of Elves. So two books back, the very beginning of two books back, a character that's so insignificant gets mentioned again. And I think it was last episode that I talked about that, that he does this a lot in these books. He'll bring back very minor characters in very minor ways. And I just think it's cool. It's just, I'm really enjoying it because when I read these books through the first time, I read them really fast and I missed so much stuff. Like I'm learning a lot more this time, you know, rereading each chapter like five or six times and also listening to the audiobook version on top of that. Um, yeah, I, I'm learning a lot, but I'm also noticing these things, um, the callbacks to these small characters that I didn't notice when I read the books through the first time. And I just, I don't know, I think it's really cool. So I think I did say in the last episode or whenever it was that I first pointed that out, that I'm going to bring it up at any time I notice it. And 
so here was another one. <laughs> this was another time that that happened. Uh, not really much else important about her except they use her cart. But when it comes to the character herself, that's it. <laughs> I think that's got to be it. I mean, maybe she could come up again. She's dead now, but I don't know. Maybe something interesting will be said about her in the future. But yep, that was Vera. Vera something or another. I'm not trying to say that last name again. All right. So this is actually where they come across Zoltan's group when they're searching through this battlefield. And they come across him when they hear singing. So Dandelion joins in, which at first really angers Milva and Geralt because of the danger he could be putting them in. Because you don't know who's... There's a lot of bad people around at all times. So you don't know who you're going to be exposing yourself to. But uh, Zoltan's group, of course, turns out to be friendly. And Dandelion himself actually gets along really well with them. I mean, they think they all get along. Milva has a few issues with them, but nothing serious. Uh, but yeah, Dandelion and the dwarves and the one gnome, uh, they get along super well. I think they become fast friends. So a couple of little things to know about them since they're new characters. Zoltan has a talking vulgar parrot named Field Marshal Windbag, and they're always playing cards. Um, they've got this card game called Barrel. So that is something that they like to do a lot when they're on their breaks. Also, Zoltan has a sword that's supposed to be really, really good. And he actually lets Geralt use it when he fights the men who attack the farm woman. Yeah, the farm woman, <laughs> whatever you want to call her. She doesn't have a name. So it's um, interesting. He explains that all good swords are forged by dwarves in Mahakam. And Percival, Percival's the name of the uh, gnome, he says that gnomes are the ones who add the finishing touches to these weapons. Just wanted to throw that in there because I don't know. I know I've never mentioned this before in any of the previous episodes, but I don't know if it's even been brought up in any of the previous chapters. I don't think so. About Just about the dwarves are the ones that forge the really good weapons in Mahakam. I think it might have been mentioned that Mahakam is mostly inhabited by dwarves, but that's probably all it was. But I don't think I've even said that. So just in case you were wondering, a lot of dwarves live in Mahakam. So Geralt has this plan to reach the Yoruga and take a boat down to the Delta. Zoltan informs him that Nilfgaard built a pontoon bridge that's guarded day and night. So this is where he's overwhelmed with feelings of helplessness and resignation. Sorry, that was helplessness and resignation. I had a hard time getting that out. Uh, yeah, so this is where Geralt is really starting to experience those feelings because um, he can't do what he wanted to do. He can't get down to the Delta. He can't get on the Yoruga and sail down there because of that bridge. Uh, so now he really doesn't know how he can reach Nilfgaard. And I, or... Now that I say it, I'm not sure if it's so much that is the case, like he can't get there or it's just going to, he has to just keep going around. So that's what's happened a few times because of this war. He has to just keep going around, like further and further around. And Nilfgaard, I think I've talked about this before. We don't know exactly how far away it is, but it's really, really far. Like it's going to take him a long time to get there. Even if he were to just make a beeline from Broccolon Forest to where Ciri is supposedly located, I think it would take probably a long time. And I'm just, this is how I'm imagining it. I'm imagining it that Geralt is in this one spot starting out in Broccolon, and he basically has to make like, well, it's kind of tough to describe if you can't, if you're not watching on YouTube, <laughs> but he basically has to like go around and maybe like get a little bit closer and then go further out away. Yeah, I think you get it. <laughs> <laughs> it's um, it's kind of hopeless, and I can't even imagine how frustrating that would be, especially when you are traveling outdoors. You know, you don't have access to a lot of food regularly. I think with Zoltan's group, they they do provide them with some decent food. It seems like, uh, but yeah, just living outside, sleeping outside, and all the while knowing that you can't get to this person that you really care about, that you want to rescue. It sucks. It really sucks for him. So my sympathies are with Geralt in this chapter, big time. But also, he doesn't know where Siri is. <laughs> and with that note, 
he keeps having these dreams. So he has the same dream of Siri riding through a village, wearing heavy makeup, holding hands with a cropped haired girl. And the village, the villagers are looking at her and they're pointing at her. And he says that she's leaving a trail of death behind her. So Geralt is actually seeing what we read at the end of the last chapter, like what we saw Siri doing with the rats. So he's seeing where she is in real life in his dreams. Just, I don't know what he's going to do about that, but I mean, it's kind of good. I mean, it's better than just thinking that she's in Nilfgaard under Amir's protection, because that's not the case. Uh, so he tells Milva about this, and he says that he doesn't believe in those kind of dreams. But Milva says that she does, so maybe Milva will be the voice of reason and tempt him to listen to the dreams, go in whatever direction. I mean, I don't think that uh, in these dreams anybody's out there just saying, oh, this is exactly where we're located right now. Like, this is, if, if you wanted to find me and you're having a prophetic dream, this is where you locate me. <laughs> I don't think that it's really that easy, but I don't know. Maybe he would recognize some landmark. Probably not. I don't. I don't know that he, she is currently in an area that Gerald's ever been in, but it's something at least for now because he ends up having um, another dream of Siri uh, in a different spot. He has a dream where she's in a barn and there's loud music and shouting and she's dancing. So uh, we haven't witnessed that happen with Siri, but I'm sure that that has happened. I'm sure that he's actually seeing what's really happened with her. So there's that. Maybe his dreams will just keep getting updated with what Siri is doing in real life, and it might eventually give him something to go off of. I'm not sure how that will work out, but uh, he needs to get there fast. And uh, I mean, it just sucks because he keeps getting delayed, but he needs to get there fast because he says that he can feel in the dreams that death is behind her and there's fire ahead of her. It's not that specific, but it doesn't sound good. And then also when she was in that barn dancing, he said that death, ooh, I just, I actually just got goosebumps saying this, but it really creeped me out. He said death was on the roof on the, of the barn dancing too. Ooh, that is creepy and scary and just all around bad. So it looks like Siri might be in danger as always. <laughs> when is she not? But now it's a different kind of danger. And who's going to rescue her if not Geralt? Maybe Yennefer. I don't know. Maybe we'll hear about her soon. <laughs> it's been a long time. Chapter four of Time of Contempt. That's the last time we've heard about Yennefer. And we are now in chapter two of Baptism of Fire. There were seven chapters in Time of Contempt. So it's a lot of time going by without any updates there. I keep talking about it because it's just such a very important character to get such little updates on. <laughs> but hopefully she's okay. Just doesn't seem like it. Maybe she woke up in a desert somewhere too like Siri did. I doubt it. <laughs> Alrighty. So for my closing thoughts, I actually don't have any. I just hope that Something changes so that Geralt can get closer to the direction that Ciri is in faster. I hope Yennefer turns up. I hope something happens with this war that causes it to end a lot quicker. But that's not seeming likely. None of these things are seeming likely. Yeah. It's, uh, it's just a shame. Um, <laughs> I mean, obviously it's a shame. But there was a chunk of time where I w would end these episodes saying, oh, hopefully these things get better. And they changed, but they didn't get better. It just went from one crappy situation to another crappy situation. <laughs> and I like, I, I mean, no, I love these characters and I want good things for them. And I really want them to be re reunited. Ah, it's such a bummer. Geralt and Ciri were reunited for such a short amount of time after he left her at the uh, temple school. And that reunion wasn't even good. And now they've been separated for way too long. And it doesn't look like they're going to see each other again anytime soon. But anything could change. 
We'll see. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's all I have for you. So just to let you know, in case you didn't, these episodes are available on YouTube with video, Spotify, and Apple Podcasts with just the audio. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much for joining. And I'll catch you all in the next episode.